All right, I'm here with Rob Chestnut. Rob, welcome to the podcast. Nate, thanks for having me. I'm really excited that you decided to join me. Um, it's been a long time since I've seen you. We worked together a little bit in, uh, well, you were the head of trust and safety at eBay, and my company was and is one of, if not the largest seller of power sports vehicles on eBay. And at the time, uh, must have been early 2000s, at the time, there was quite a problem with fraud going on in the automotive and motorcycle category, large ticket items. And um, I had come on to the advisory council to sort of represent the automotive side or the motorcycle, the power sports side. And um, I remember thinking what an incredibly impossible job that you had. Um, you know, just seeing the amount of uh, things that we had to be concerned for and fraud that was going on within one small category and realizing that eBay covered a breadth and width that was gigantic. Uh, I, I don't, I, I couldn't imagine um, what was involved with your day to day. Yeah. Um, it, it was daunting. I'll tell you, we, we had about seven. I remember uh, when I started it, I looked at it, we had about 7 million items listed every day oh from around the world in multiple languages. Uh, and it was a daunting task to try to figure out, uh, you know, which of the listings posed a risk to the community and were fraudulent and which ones were good. Uh, it was early days internet when, uh, you know, tools for this sort of thing just didn't exist. So we had to build them. Yeah. And you, you assembled uh, eventually quite a large team involved with, with looking at all these issues, didn't you? We did. There were, uh, uh, I think when I, when I started, it was just uh, me and uh, two other people the company gave me to start. But, uh, you know, the, the CEO, you know, Meg Whitman was great. Meg said, you tell me what you need, because this is critical to the future of the company. And I think, you know, four years later, we had 2,000 people. And I'm and, sure it's yeah. grown, you know, even more since then. And, you know, a number of the people that we uh, had on those early teams have now moved on to lead trust and safety for Facebook and YouTube, other companies across the Internet. So this is and those teams are exponentially even larger. So this is uh, you know, th this is something I, I was didn't realize at the time, but I was kind of witnessing the very early days of internet trust and safety uh, and platforms and the chat the global challenge I think the companies face in this area. And I think uh, today now even more than ever the idea of a platform trying to regulate or control what goes on within that platform and all of the sticky issues that go with that, especially, you know, recently with, you know, uh, for example, uh, Twitter removing Trump and anybody that they feel, you know, was associated with the, with the insurrection, um, you know, trying to figure out how do you, how do you manage your platform and keep it appropriate, but yet still honor our constitution, you know, it's, it's not an well, easy concept. Or, or It's not. Well, I think the first question is, to what extent do you regulate your platform, right? I mean, I think in the early days of the internet in particular, I think the internet was seen as a place where, you know, all were welcome. Uh, free speech is critical. You know, everyone you know, should have the opportunity to express their own views. So, you know, what do you do if you are running a company and some of the views that are being expressed are inconsistent with your values, uh, things that you believe to be false, what is your obligation to do something about it, uh, both ethically and perhaps even legally? And those were, I think those were things that, you know, back, you know, back in the days when we first met, Nate, that was almost 20 years ago. Uh, you know, I, I think the world was uh, tipped a bit more in toward, well, you, you're just a platform. Yeah. You know, you're you're not you shouldn't be involved in those sorts of things. Who are you to have an opinion about? It? But, you know, the, the world's changed dramatically just, I think, in the last five years. And, you know, more and more the world wants platforms to get involved. They you know, they want platforms to step in uh, and, you know, stop for the spread of things that are obviously lies or, you know, things that, that will incite riots. Uh, or, you know, obviously racist and the like. So I think the world wants more from companies now. They want them to step up. They don't want them to say we're only a platform. And that's a perfect lead in to talk about your book because uh, your book, Intentional Integrity, How Smart Companies Can Lead an Ethical Revolution, 
gets really deeply into that, not only whether or not you're obligated to, but what the environment around having or not having a code of ethics and rules of ethics for your employees to understand and follow and to be able to implement um, really talks to an age where nowadays, uh, I think I think you're you're it's very obvious you're leaving yourself very liable, very open if you don't. So it's not even just an issue of doing the right thing within your company. It's also what can you put in front of a jury if you get it yourself into a situation where uh, where you don't have any rules and you can't define what your company did about a particular issue or something along those lines. Yeah, you know, the world's watching. I think in the old days, uh, you know, uh, employees were afraid to speak up if they saw something inside the company that was troubling. Uh, and I, I think today, employees want to be part of a company that has values consistent with their own. Uh, I they agree they with want, that. you know, and they and and so if they see something that troubles them, uh, they're talking to each other now. They'll go on Slack. They'll go on uh, Blind, the Blind app, and they'll start communicating. And then they'll post about it. They'll tweet about it. They'll blog. They'll even organize a walkout. These mm-hmm. are things that would have been unheard of 20 years ago. Um, but, you know, I, I think that expectations are up. And by the way, it's not just employees, Nate. It's customers. You know, customers, sure. we, we are in an age of conscious consumerism where consumers want to do business with companies that are aligned with their personal values. So if <laughs> Look you, at you don't hand. have a choice, right? Like Patagonia, exactly, exactly right. Well, I think one of the reasons Patagonia has been so successful is that they've uh, they've made doing good uh, part of their business plan. Yeah, you know, it it is it is uh, woven into the fabric uh, of and the culture of the company. That makes it a more attractive place to work, and it also makes it very attractive for customers to do business there. And you know, uh, in the old days, uh, I, I keep saying in the old days, you know, <laughs> as of that long ago, I think people looked at business as a dog eat dog world. Oh, business is tough. You know, nice guys finish last. What we're seeing is that companies that act with integrity actually outperform the market and they outperform their competitors simply because they've got these advantages of a more energized employee base and customers that get passionate about brands that are aligned with their values. So uh, you can't, as a company, ignore this idea of integrity. Uh, You are now forced because the world is forcing it. Your, your own employees are forcing you uh, to take a hard look at the way you do business and the way you treat people inside the company and the way you interact with the world. Uh, because if you don't do it, you'll, you know, your brand can literally be brought down by the stuff. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I noticed about the book is uh, obviously with your background, almost all of your background has been with really large companies. And I found myself as I was reading the book, thinking about, um, how I would apply, um, how I would apply, I don't have a code of ethics in my company. I'll tell you flat out, my company is, uh, is very much based on a core principle. I don't, I can't talk about it enough. You know what I mean? Because it's so important to me. My company was founded upon an emotional need that I had, not a financial need. And as it grew and got bigger and bigger from a, owner or CEO point, uh, I'm not the CEO anymore, I'm just the owner. But from my ownership point of view, uh, I have to say it created and still does create a lot of fear for me that somehow my company would represent what we do differently than what its purpose is. And so we have, you know, you, I, you go back to the old days and uh, one of the business trends 25 years ago was you had to have a mission statement. You know, I mean, you need to, you know, it's sort of along the same lines. You need to convey clearly to the people that work for you and to your customers what you stand for, what's important and who you are. But having a, having a code of ethics, as you describe it in your book, and implementing it as a very much a process to implement it is something that I wonder about small businesses. And when you look at a small business that's doing well and growing well, almost everybody within that team is doing multiple things and everybody's got their hands full. And this is one of those 
projects that doesn't immediately have tangible results, even though we all know it's important and we know that we need to define this for everyone that works there. Uh, it's hard to find the time and effort when you don't even have an HR person, for example, or something like that. Like, where is the line? Because you do mention in the book whether you're, you know, sort of a bootstrap uh, single member LLC or, or, or whether you're a company with thousands of people, the importance is the same. But what do you see in the real world about the difficulty of, well, I guess, let me ask it this way, two parts. Do you think a lot of small companies have that mission outside of just being profitable? And then two, if they do, how well are they doing it? Implementing uh, a, a, a policy along this lines, and then let alone, we want to talk about how to implement it and make sure we held everyone accountable. Yeah, I, I think you're missing something as a business if you don't have a North Star, a purpose. And profit is not purpose. I agree. The profit is uh, something that a business needs to survive. But it, every company needs a reason why it needs to exist. It has to have some something good for the world. If you don't have that, you're really missing out on an opportunity to energize your employee base and energize your customer base, build your business. Uh, companies that don't have this, I think, are lacking in a certain degree of heart and soul. Uh, and I believe that in this 21st century company, uh, in, in this 21st century, companies like that aren't going to be as successful. We have to get out of this old way of looking at companies. You know, for you know, for decades, mate, we, everybody lived under this uh, idea of shareholder value. Mm. What do I mean by that? It, it was something that Milton Friedman came up with with academics. And it was this notion that companies exist for their shareholders only. Anything that increases shareholder value is good and you must do it. Yeah. Anything that doesn't help your shareholder value uh, is not important and you should not do it. Now, what this has led to is a, a world where people make short-term decisions. If it drives your stock price up, then it's good. If it, the stock price goes down, it's bad, often in the very short term. And there are a lot of negative consequences of this. So you know, not only are you failing to build for the long term, which I think ultimately hurts your business, but you're often cutting ethical corners that might be perceived to cost you in the short run. Like, hey, let's don't worry about the carbon we're dumping into the air. Uh, you know, dealing with it might co will cost a little bit of money. Yeah. Or, yeah, I know those suppliers on the other side of the world uh, are probably engaged in child labor, or their their working conditions are terrible, but they're the cheapest price, and we're we're obligated to be thinking only about our shareholders. I, I think what we've seen just in recent years is that the world is tired of this. The world realizes this is a very short-term, very selfish thinking, and we need more from companies, right? And shareholder value is now being rejected, at least in name. You know, uh, Larry Fink at BlackRock, you know, the Business Roundtable, they've now all spoken up. Even the academic who came up with the notion of shareholder value now admits it was wrong. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a terrible mistake. And what it's being replaced with is this idea of stakeholders. Every company needs to identify who its stakeholders are. Now, at Airbnb, for example, you know, we had five stakeholders. Uh, our investors, and your investors and shareholders are always going to be a stakeholder of any company. Uh, but we also recognize that our guests, our host, and our employees were also important stakeholders. And we also had a fifth stakeholder, which I think is telling. And that is the communities where we do business. So Airbnb actually acknowledged in, 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 inside the company and now externally as a public company that whenever we make decisions, we are thinking about what is the impact of that decision on all five stakeholders? Mm. We have an obligation to the world, really. We have an obligation to think about how we're operating has an impact in all these different communities. So it's not just the shareholders that are important, although they are important. It is our customers, our employees, and the world as a whole. And when you make decisions based upon the stakeholder theory, this idea that you have an obligation to a, a, an array, really, of people around your business, you actually end up making better decisions, more in, decisions that have more integrity, 
And ultimately, your business is going to be more successful because you're thinking now more for the long term instead of just what's going to drive exactly. up the stock price this week. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I think I, I talk about it a lot when I, when I'm doing any business consulting or, or when I've got a friend or something that wants to start a business. The first question I ask is, why? Why do you want to do this? And if the answer is, well, because I need a job or because I want to get rich, I'm like, you got to keep working. You're not, you haven't figured it out there because you can't make decisions if you're always following money. Because when you own a business, sometimes you're selling for cash flow. Sometimes you're selling for profitability. Sometimes you're selling for inventory turns. And it's not one set of guidelines of just make money. But what I know is that when your company stands for something, when and when it stands for something that creates a value that removes friction within that marketplace or within that industry, then you that's your purpose. And if you do it well, the byproduct of, of serving your purpose is you will make money. Now, yeah. if you have a bunch of people that don't understand how money works, you could probably solve a lot of friction and go out of business quick. So you have to be profitable so you can grow, so you're healthy, so you can serve more people with your mission. Right. And I wonder sometimes, like I think about when I was growing the business, I have I have a, a couple audiences that I need to make feel comfortable with me. My customers, my employees, and the bank. And when you're a small company and you're you're relying on financing from outside sources, sometimes those pressures can be very Contra, uh, very counter to emissions. For example, I sell <laughs> motorcycles. The, 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 my company's uh, absolute most important things are tell the truth. That is, every process that we did and do and every interaction that we do and every way we set up payroll, no one is at, on commission because those are types of things that, that possibly can prevent people telling you for the truth. If someone's interested in one bike versus another, if one bike makes one of my employees more money than the other, it's human nature to say he's probably going to be more interested in what benefits them financially than their than my employees. So I remove Well, it's a conflict of interest, right? It, it you don't want to set up processes that create a, a conflict of interest like that between right. doing what's right for your wallet versus what's right for the customer. Right. So you don't want to set up systems that encourage that. That's right. But what I was just going to say is like with the bank at the end of the year, when you might be looking at, they're looking at your line of credit or your covenants or things along those lines. And they want to know why you haven't, why you're not building more equity in the company or why you're not putting in cash. And you have to say, because I'm reinvesting it because I'm building something to scale or I'm building it for the future or my company serves a mission. If it's not a 501c, um, as a business owner, it can be really hard to, how to figure out how to be uncompromising in areas like this that are that important, that are going to really serve the longevity of your company. Yeah, well, Nate, it's hard to run the business. And and I think in the old days, it might be a little easier. If, if your only master was money and yeah. you make all your decisions that based solely on the basically short-term financial, um, maybe the individual decisions are easier, but you're selling yourself short. I think today's businesses are harder to run because these things are in conflict. You know, there there are things that you're going to be forced to choose between something that will benefit the bank versus benefiting your employees versus benefiting your customers versus benefiting the the areas and communities where you serve. Mm. So, you know, like look at Airbnb, you know, we recognize that there are very few decisions that are going to benefit all of your stakeholders, right? If if a decision is actually good for all of your stakeholders, it's a really easy decision. Yeah. yeah. And you know, life life doesn't give you that many easy decisions. Um, but the harder thing comes when you have to make trade-offs, when you have to make a decision that's going to benefit one stakeholder over the other. What we would do is we would actually have metrics for the health of our different stakeholders. Now everybody's good at having financial metrics, right? We've all got we're all we've all got our balance sheets that show us, uh, you know, what uh, what our revenues are, how many customers we've got, what our marketing expenses are, and the like. But what we haven't done as well is come up with metrics that measure the health of our employees, or measure the health of the communities where we operate. Right. Mm. So what at Airbnb we would do is we would try to measure the health of all of our stakeholders, and whenever we made a decision 
uh, we would ex- explicitly acknowledge the trade-offs. And some decisions we might, you know, go with something that's really good for the the, the shareholders and good for the financials. In others, we might make a decision that's probably better for the customers, might hurt us financially in the short run. And I'm going to give you an example of that. Yeah. Uh, back, you know, five years ago, I, I was general counsel of Airbnb. It's pretty new to the company. And there were reports that uh, there were people being discriminated against on Airbnb, mm. that there were uh, guests who were trying to find a room, but due to the color of their skin, they were being turned down by hosts. And, you know, there were a number of reports online about this. You know, there was a hashtag, Airbnb while black. Uh, people were starting to study the phenomenon of, you know, creating identical profiles, except for the, you know, yeah. a, a picture of, of someone of color versus white. Mm. And, you know, then, then a couple of lawsuits started coming in. So, you know, look, as the general counsel, I went off and did my legal work, right? I, I studied what is the liability of a platform? Uh, when when uh, people may be committing acts like this on the platform, uh, you know, is there even a legal obligation uh, or uh, to uh, for discrimin- does discrimination do discrimination laws even apply to something like Airbnb? So I go in to meet with the founder of Airbnb, CEO founder Brian Chesky, right, and I start to go through the law with him on this. And Brian holds up his hand and says, "Stop, I don't care." I'm like, what? <laughs> "You don't care?" And Brian said. Rob, Airbnb's mission is to increase belonging in the world. Belonging is this idea that we all ought to get out from behind our computers and go out and interact with the world, meet people who are different than we are, travel in an immersive sense and really get to know each other and become familiar with unfamiliar things and unfamiliar people. And Brian said, if discrimination is going on on Airbnb, we are failing as a company. Because that's our mission. So he said, I really don't care what the law is. He said, you can go deal with the law, but we're going to fix it. And we did a number of things to address racism on Airbnb. One of which, for example, we required all users to agree to a simple statement that they would accept everyone, regardless of the color of their skin, their religion, their nationality, or the like. A very simple non-discrimination pledge. It wasn't the law in a lot of places where Airbnb did business. But Brian felt that it was so fundamental to our mission. It was important that people should take this pledge. So we asked Brian, like, well, Brian, what do we do with the people that won't accept the pledge? And Brian <laughs> said, and Brian said, give them, give them the opportunity to say, I disagree. And if they disagree, um, then they can't use our platform. We lost 1.1% of our user base virtually overnight. Which probably now, represented a fairly <laughs> big amount of money. Yeah, right. 1.1% <laughs> gone overnight. It's not yeah. something that's good for your money, right? Yeah. Uh, but Brian felt that there was something bigger and more important than that. He, he, he felt that um, making a, taking a stand against racism was good for the world. Yeah. And it was something that was good for our guest community and something that was important for our mission. So that was a trade-off he was willing to make, and he did it. And I think that in the long run, because Airbnb stood for something like that, right? And for another thing is that Airbnb canceled reservations of known white supremacists who traveled to Charlottesville, Virginia for the the, uh, right. the rallies. Mm. Um, and also uh, you know, canceled reservations uh, for people who traveled to, to Washington, D.C. for the, the Capitol riots. I so that. I think, but I think in the long run, that helps build Airbnb's brand. Sure. And and when you take a stand on something like that, ultimately, I think it's probably better for your company and will actually be a, a financial uh, boon to the company as well. Well, if your company is growing and you made a conscious decision that 1.1% or that 1.1% made its own conscious decision that it wasn't, wasn't, didn't want to be in your platform, that 1% you eliminated, if you're still growing and there's still market opportunity, um, it probably sets you up a lot better for the majority of thinking people, I don't want to be on a platform that that just freely doesn't want to take a stance on that. Or let's say the other way, I really would much rather sell my services on a platform that uh, mimics my morals and ethics and values. How, how many people would we have lost if we had done nothing? How many right. people said, you know what, I want to go, I want to be at a place like Airbnb because it's consistent with my personal values. And in fact, because it's consistent with my personal values, uh, I'm 
actually a spokesperson now. You now I'm going to tell my friends fan. about it. Right? Yeah. Now I'm going to be a raving fan. And we want raving fans. Yep. Also, it was something that really inspired our employee base, uh, something that attracted people to want to come to work at Airbnb and stay there. So, you know, those are things that aren't quite as easy to measure. But those are things, you know, Brian talks about being a 21st century company. 21st century companies can't be thinking about the short term. Brian says they actually need to have an infinite time horizon. They need to be thinking, Brian will make a decision that might hurt the stock price today if he believes that over the next 10 years, it will help the company. Uh, and, and he won't think twice about it, right? Because his time horizon is literally infinite as opposed to, oh, we've got to do this. I, I know I've been in, in meetings where I've heard people say things like, uh, we need to do this because if, if we don't hit this number, the, the market's going to react in a negative way. The stock price might, might yeah. go down, right? And, and, that sort of short-term thinking, I think, in the long run, will kill you. Yeah, yeah, it would. Co- it goes right back to what we're saying about standing for something. Because if if you don't, then your balance sheet and your financials are constantly they're 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 wagging they're the tail wagging the dog. You know what right. I mean? Instead of the opposite. Sure. And uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I was really thinking about when you're saying that too. Not only would a policy, a, a clear policy that says we don't tolerate racists or everyone in this platform has to accept that that's not an issue right now one of the hardest things to one of the hardest parts of of running a business is finding good talented people and people work hard and they want to be part of something bigger than just getting a paycheck it works the same way it's the way it's sure. like you said it's the way we're thinking as people nowadays is i want to be part of something as a consumer i want to be part of something as an employee i want to be part of something and that you know it says it says something bigger about the general psyche of of us right now but we're all feeling like we want to have an impact on the world i think like in today's internet world we all realize that we actually can and our little voice isn't such a little voice anymore. And which, it worked, work doesn't feel like work when you're inspired, when you yeah. feel like you've got a bigger purpose. And you know, I think what companies are tapping into is the, the power of having a mission that inspires their employees. Now, you, it just can't be a slogan you put on the wall yeah. because employees will see right through it. And then what they'll do, the employees will, they won't stand for it. You know, they'll be they'll tweeting about it. it you. They'll use it against you. So you mm-hmm. got to walk the talk, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I had to be honest with you. I, I stopped reading a lot of business books because <laughs> they made me feel bad. Like business books, when you write a business book, you're writing best case scenario. Here's, here's the ideal blueprint. And then sometimes as a business owner, you read a business book and go, oh shit, I'm failing here. I'm failing here. I'm failing here. I really need to put more attention here. How am I going to do this? And it's really easy to be overwhelmed as a business owner. And I will say, let's add another one of the reasons why you need to have something like something more important than just making money because, man, it's hard. It is really hard the amount of things that you have to juggle uh, in any high level management position, let alone being the owner of a company. And we need a compass. We really need a compass as we build our company. What are we doing? What's our purpose? I mean, it sounds so silly. My company tell the truth. But there's a reason. My industry is notorious for not telling the truth. And the amount of friction that that causes in the marketplace for buyers, the lack of trust and things like that. I had been on the other side. I understand what my customers have to go through. And I'm always looking at my business from that point of view. And that's my motivation. My motivation is not necessarily another Ferrari another, as if I have one, any Ferrari. (laughs) (laughs) My motivation is that I remember buying a motorcycle from somebody and getting screwed. And I know what that feels like. And I'm not only in my company, not going to be one of the companies that does that to people, but my company is going to be the one that tries to make the industry change because I'm a motorcyclist and that's, that's my community. And that's unacceptable to me. And we've yeah. actually driven a lot of change in our industry with things like no commission salespeople and all the areas that are friction. Uh, uh, we work on reducing, but that's my, that's where I get my energy. And I think if you build a company that has a purpose to you personally, that resonates with your employees, your customers, um, then then there's it, it's a little bit of 
magic pixie dust that turns your business into something way more than just, you know, a paycheck. It does. You know, there's a guy by the name of Adam Grant. He's got a, a great book called Give and Take. And, you know, Give and Take, uh, the, the fundamental premise behind Give and Take is that there are people in the world who are givers. They're, they always take an extra few minutes to talk to somebody else and help someone else along mm-hmm. the way. Uh, they're not purely just driven by selfish motives. They're, they, they are altruistic. Uh, and then there are takers who are just, they're out to, you know, they're always out about me, right? The world's yeah. a zero sum game and it's about how much I can get. Yeah. Who is more financially successful? Always givers or takers? Always. And the interesting thing is the givers, the data shows that the givers are actually more financially successful than the Absolutely. takers. Why? Because everybody looks at the takers and understands pretty quickly where they're coming from. Yeah. Doesn't enjoy doing business with people like that. Doesn't want, people won't go out of their way to help takers. But the more philanthropic people are, if, if you look at two people and look at the level, uh, how much they give to charities, the person that gives more to charities is actually more financially successful than the person who gives less to charities, simply because in giving, you actually build a network of people that want to start rooting for you and want to do things for you as well. And I think a lot of this is true in business. If you're thinking about stakeholders beyond just those that are trying to put the money in their pockets, if you're thinking about your employees, if you're thinking about your customers, if you're thinking about your community, it actually bounces back to your own benefit. And that's the beauty of all of this, right? Well, the, th- the beauty of it is you know, doing the right thing uh, is actually the best thing for a business. And I'll add to that there's a reason, because we as human beings, before we want to interact with another human being on any level, the type of interaction we have is greatly dependent upon the trust that we feel coming from the other person. And that is why everything that we just said, all of those things we talked about, acting with integrity, having a mission, having a purpose, it builds trust. Uh, and, and trust is at the heart of human relationships, right? It's, right. it's what makes the world go around. And yet, yeah. if you look at data, they, uh, there's an organization called the Edelman Trust Service. And the Edelman Trust Survey actually goes out and surveys tens of thousands of people all around the world every year and measures the level of trust in a variety of institutions. What we've seen is a steady decline mm-hmm. in trust, trust in government trust in the the media, trust in business. And that lack of trust means that we have trouble getting things done because without trust in in relationships, um, we we can't accomplish things the way that we can accomplish things if there's a high level of trust. So what we need to do is we need to start building back that trust if we're going to be successful in solving some of the big problems in the world. Well, I think one of the ways that you can do that when you're spreading this word and this message is by showing clearly that it's a really good, profitable business strategy to be vulnerable and be trustworthy because the business that follows when you're dedicated to that uh, is literally a, a secret weapon in today's world because no matter how much a lot of people talk about it, it still is not the majority of businesses and people that you deal with because it takes a lot of vulnerability to to put yourself out there to try to build that trust with the people around you and i think people are a little well i think we as people naturally are a little bit guarded and that's what i mean by you you've got to have that trust before you can open up to somebody but what a business i i was constantly amazed when i built the company that all i had to do was just treat people well I, I mean, like that shouldn't be a business strategy. That should be the basic. If you're going to be in business and you're going to employ people, and I don't want to sound too high and mighty, but it's a, just like you said, it's good. It's a very good business strategy to put these things in place. Well, the world's pushing business in this direction. Why? Well, there's an unprecedented level of transparency in the world today. Yeah. So, in you know, 20 years ago, if you treat someone poorly, a lot of people won't know about it. Yep. You know, back when I was growing up, Nate, there were three news stations, right? Yep. And the news station, <laughs> and, 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 right? And, and that's, uh, that's how you got your news. And if somebody got treated poorly, then chances are no one would ever hear about it. Yeah. Today, everyone is their own news station. And everyone's got a camera crew that follows them around everywhere. And the camera crew looks like your cell phone that I'm holding up right now. Yep. Uh, and there's not one newspaper in town anymore. There are a million newspapers in town because everybody's got social media and everybody can post about it. So 
Um, if, if people are being treated poorly, employees aren't going to like it. Customers aren't going to like it. They're going to be posting reviews online about it. And so therefore, you as a business now, the consequences of treating people poorly uh, are are much greater than they ever have been. And they're pushing companies toward it now to the point where it may not even be fair, right? Where companies can get treated poorly on social media sometimes, yeah. even when they try to treat people well. It is yeah. hard. Uh, but I, I do think that we are in an age of unprecedented transparency that pushes companies to act with a level of transparency like we've never seen before. Yeah, I, th- I remember very clearly, uh, I started my business on eBay out of my garage and customer reviews were terrifying. I mean, they're terrifying. And I remember thinking, you know, people used to say when I first started, oh, it must be a lot easier to build a business online. You don't need all that expenses. And, all. and I'm like, man, can you imagine that if every customer that walked through the door of Cumberland Farms got to write a note on the front door before any more customers walked in saying that rude bitch at the counter didn't, you know, I mean, like, and that's what eBay basically sort of brought out in the world and, and empowered all of us to have a say that if, if I don't feel like I was treated fairly by that company, I have a platform to let others know or in feel almost feel obligated to warn them. I mean, sometimes yeah. it almost feels like a completely impossible task as a business owner, but you have to either embrace it or don't do it. I mean, it, you have to. Really- right. I think eBay's feedback system was probably it's, it's a game changing innovation. I agree. Uh, and, and it does force businesses. It, it raises the bar. You're right. If every time you walk into a store, uh, the, re- uh, the experience of the last hundred customers was written on the yeah. door for all to see, how would that change the way the business operates? Yeah. I think the answer is it, right? It forces you to raise your game constantly. And it is terrifying to run the business. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you're truly committed to, to doing the right thing for your customers, uh, ultimately, you win in this sort of a transparency, a transparent game. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I, let's. Uh, I'm going to change gears a little bit. I'm really curious, like with your background as a federal prosecutor, and then moving to eBay, and you've been involved with a lot. Well, a couple of really large companies, Airbnb, obviously. Are you? I'm. I'm I was unclear. Are you still with Airbnb? Are you still counsel for them? Or what's the situation? Right. No, I'm an advisor to the company now. What I, what I found, Nate, was when you write a book, no one told me this when I first started writing a book. I thought, well, I'll write this book and the publisher will go out and they'll, they'll market it, right? Now, apparently, the, if, you, if you write a book, you've got to market the book. Mm. By the time I finished the book and realized that I, I, I thought, you know what, there's no way I can have a full-time job, a day job at Airbnb, and talk about this book, which is really important to me. So I worked out an arrangement with the company where I stepped aside as the general counsel. I still uh, work with the company as an advisor, but I spend my my time now talking to to on, on podcasts, talking at schools, talking at conferences, and talking to other companies about the importance of integrity. So it's something I, I I've I've been a lawyer for thirty five years, so I'm at the point in my life now where I get to do what I'm really passionate about. That's what I was going to ask you. Where does this passion come from? I mean, you've done a lot of things that have they haven't. I mean, trust and safety, uh, ethics you know, uh, chief ethics officer, your work has been involved, but I, I wonder if like how much of that is your, your lawyer background where you really see the consequences of not doing things the right way and how costly and embarrassing and, and everything that goes with it can be. Yeah. I, I think you know, it started when I was, you know, when I was young and you know, my mom, my mom was from the South, uh, very proper, and a, a deep believer in integrity. And I actually tell a story at the, at the, at the end of my book, uh, about my mom and, uh, and her belief in integrity. And then I think as a federal prosecutor, I saw the consequences of what could happen to people if they don't act with integrity. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, a lot of my career, you know, even as I moved to, into the, the corporate world at uh, Airbnb, eBay, and Chegg, uh, I, I've done a lot around rules and about, you know, how thinking about the way that you act, acting with intentionality, can build trust, and that trust in turn can be a real driver for bringing the world closer together through commerce or, or, or the like. Uh, that's what I think been a common thread in what I do, and you know the the, the culmination I think of of my experience you know comes out in the book, uh, and because I, I, I deeply believe that uh, business can can play. We need business to step up. We got a lot of problems in the world. 
And we need businesses to step up and play a critical role in addressing those problems. And building trust with customers, building trust with communities is, is critical to that work. And if I can you know, do something to help businesses think about uh, how to weave integrity into their culture and in the way they operate, I think that's, a, that's my power. That's my mission. And to me, that's what gets me enthusiastic about waking up every day. Yeah, that's cool. It definitely comes across in the book. I, and I have to say that the book is a really easy read. I mean, it's not, yeah. it, it's, it really is not in, in, a, in a great way. Like it's nothing that anybody's going to be intimidated by. Um, I think the worst thing is, is just realizing you've got some more work to do, or I'll speak for myself. I've got some more work to do. We all do. No, integrity isn't perfection. You know, and, and, you know, I think, you know, one of the reasons people are afraid to talk about it a little bit is because they're like, well, you know, I'm not perfect, so who am I to talk about it? And mm. I, I think if, if integrity perfection were perfection, then no one would have integrity. I think integrity really is more about having a North Star, uh, having something that you believe in, and you know, committing to the path of, of operating in a way that's consistent with that North Star. And then also, I think, having the self-awareness to realize that you're going to get off course every now and then, yeah. that the, 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 the path can be tough. And the answers aren't always clear that you'll make mistakes. But when you make mistakes, having the self-awareness to say, acknowledge that you got off course and get back on it again. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's, uh, uh, but, but having intentionality around uh, following that path is what I think a lot of people are missing in their, in, in their personal life and in their business. Yeah. Now, the, the, uh, the, the words tell the truth for my company came out of a experience that I had and it it wasn't something that I came up with for my company it was something I came up with me, for me how to live my life I'd gone through this little internet program you ever you ever read the book or hear the book the uh, the e myth revisited by Michael Gerber no. no had a massive impact on the direction I took my company very early and it's essentially uh it's it's just it's a it's a business book about a single owner who opens a pie shop and how basically um they go from a becoming a technician to running a business and this is a real common path for a lot of businesses is that the technician makes $15 an hour but they're a laborer for a company that charges a hundred for that. And they start to go, you know, I'm the one that does the work here. I should have my own business. And they open their own business and they eventually within months are doing everything but what they know how to do. Um, and so they find themselves in, 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 in this position. And the book had, the book had such an impact on me of whether or not I was going to act like a technician or whether I was going to be self-employed or whether I was going to grow a business and the real intentional difference on doing one versus the other. But I was so enamored with the book and I had just started the business that they came out with this program and this is 2001. So it was like they sent you CDs and you had a teleconference once a week with other people that were doing the program. And it was a real, it was a basic business like soup to nuts, nine different courses, everything from marketing, starting all the little aspects that you would need to form a business. And I was already, I was already in business, but the first book, the first lesson was, um, I can't remember exactly how they, they phrased it right now. Cause I'm drawing a blank, but essentially it was, what are your, what are your intentions? You know what I mean? And, uh, I remember thinking like, what's your intention? What's your intention? And I got on the call and I said, oh, uh, I'd written, I'd gone through the workbook and my business was to be the best motorcycle business in the world and whatever. And they said, no, you missed it completely. What? Oh, that was the question. What do you want out of, I don't know if it was your life or, you know, what do you want? It was just simple. What do you want? And I could only think what I wanted for the business and explicitly like what I want is my business. I couldn't separate the two. And I could write down, I couldn't figure out what do I want? I want to be rich. I want to, I want to have a great business. I want to <laughs> be able to screw off when I want. I want to be the boss, you know, all these things, but nothing really made any sense. Nothing, nothing deep. But then I could write, I wrote down all the things I didn't want. And all of a sudden the emotion of some of my past work experiences came up. I don't want to be around bullshit artists. I don't want to be around, like, and the passion comes out. And I, I looked at list and it flowed out of me like water. And I said, what's the opposite of that? 
So this is what I don't want. What's the opposite of all this stuff I don't want? And all of a sudden I just said, what the opposite of that is to always have the courage to tell the truth. And I literally started crying. I broke down in tears at my desk because all of a sudden I thought wow. I can apply this to my relationships with my, my family. I can reply, I can apply this to the business. And I'm like the business. Oh my God, I'm selling motorcycles. If I have to always have the courage to tell the truth, it means I've got to tell everybody what's wrong with the bike. I've got to fit, I've got to, and I've got to be transparent about it. And that was the secret sauce that just absolutely transformed my company from just another seller of motorcycles to something that stood for something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. And, and um, that's powerful. That's really cool. And I think it's probably what separates your business now and makes you successful. Well, it's what I want you. It is. Yeah. It, I mean, like everything that we do, and we're always, we're a company, we're constantly raising the bar on ourselves because how can we be, be better in this? How can we be more truthful, more transparent? I don't even like that word transparent because it's bantered around like crazy, but I like truth. How, how can we be more truthful? True. And um, Jesus, I just rambled on. I forgot the point of the question I was asking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, man. Um, yeah, I really did completely lose track of what I was getting at with that. But um I'm trying to think as it relates to your book. I don't know. I guess I'll just leave it that leave it that leave it. <laughs> leave, leave it. it. That's right. right. It is. Um so um I'm really curious because I've been wanting to write a book. I've I've romanticized about writing a book a long time. How long did it take you? And did you have this book specifically in your head, or did you just want to write a book? Or did you have something like, I gotta get this out? Yeah. You know what? I never thought I would write a book. Uh, I, I was working at Airbnb and you know, we, uh, I was actually watching what was happening at Uber. And there were a lot of stories coming out of Uber. Uh, you know, there's a woman by the name of Susan Fowler wrote a famous blog post about sexual harassment at Uber. Uh, a lot of bad stories. And Uber was literally like down the street from mm -hmm. Airbnb. Young company. It was often spoken of it in the same sentence with Airbnb. And I remember reading about the problems at Uber and thinking to myself, I, I don't want to be associated with a company like that. But that sort of thing could happen anywhere. What are we, you know, what are we doing about this? And, uh, you know, wow, how do, you, how do you drive integrity into the culture of a company? Somebody better do something about this. And then I realized, I wonder who that somebody would be. <laughs> and then as, I thought, well, you know what? I'm a leader at the company. I'm the general counsel. Maybe I should do something about it. So I worked with the, the founders to, to start a program at Airbnb on integrity, uh, with the, the, the idea being that leaders need to actually have a conversation, a real authentic conversation with people about integrity and why it's important and what it means at Airbnb. And the, the program was so well received within the company. Employees just it resonated deeply with people that, uh, you know, my wife started saying, you got to write a book about this. Now, my wife early in her career was in the publishing industry. So, mm. you know, like a hammer, you know, uh, uh, everything looks like a nail to a hammer, right? Well, yes. to someone who used to be in the publishing industry, everything looks like a book. And I said, yeah. I'm not going to write a book. I don't have time. I'm the general counsel of a company, big company, I, you know? And she said, you got to write a book about this. And I said, I don't have time. And she said, I will get you a major publisher and I'll get you a writer to write it with you um, if you'll do it. And I'm like, oh yeah, sure, honey. You get me a major publishing deal and you get me a writer, I'll do the book, right? That was my mistake because she, a month yeah. later, Macmillan Publishing signed up to do the book and I had a writer. So then I had to do the book. So I'm like, all right, well, I've got a day job that's keeping me pretty busy. Uh, I, I told the writer, I'll give you every Monday night. Come in at six o'clock. We'll have food. We'll bring food into the office and I'll give you six o'clock until, you know, until we leave every Monday night. And we did that for 18 months. And you know, I, I started with this idea. It's like, okay, well, I got this integrity program at Airbnb. It's pretty cool. Uh, I, I can teach everybody this great, this great knowledge that I've got. And then I, it, we got into the process, and I thought, well, you know what? Maybe I should get a couple of other people's thoughts on integrity while I'm doing this, right? And I, I ended up talking to people like uh, Adam Silver, who's the commissioner of the NBA. And spent some time with me. I, I have a lot of respect for the way that he leads. Eric Holder, former Attorney General of the United States. Yeah. Um, a guy by the name of Dan Ariely, who's a behavioral psycho uh, a psychologist who studies dishonesty. He's mm. at Duke University. He's got a number of books. And what I what I learned as I started going through this is writing a book isn't about sharing what you know. It's actually a learning journey itself. 
And I learned as much in the writing process as I learned in doing the entire integrity program. So, you know, for me, it was, uh, it was a great learning process itself. And it, it, look, it took 18 months to do it. And that was with a writer, yeah. uh, but it was well worth it. Uh, and I came away from it, I think, with a much deeper understanding of the topic than I had when I started. Yeah, that's that's cool. I admire that. I admire that when you have that, like, I've got an idea that I just I need to get this thing out and, you know, it can serve others. And it, it, it uh, I the the effort you put in is worth the value. You know, I mean, yeah. it has value, I should say. Did you well, find- you got it scales, right? Because I don't know how many people can I sit with and have a cup of coffee with and talk about. Yes, uh, that's one thing. But you do a book and I can now reach tens of thousands of people. Uh, you know, because of the power of the internet and the power of the publishing industry to get the message out. And ultimately, you know, that that's what my, my I guess, my personal mission is about, really. It's about, you know, getting people to think about integrity in the way that they operate. And, you know, doing a, uh, having a book is one powerful way to reach a broader audience. Yeah, that's why I do a podcast. You should do a podcast. Yeah. You should do a podcast. <laughs> you do the integrity podcast. It would be excellent. Yeah. I that mean, would be a lot of fun. I've thought about doing it, but I, right now I'm just having fun uh, appearing on podcasts like yours. Yeah. Well, this is my, I, I wanted to write a book and I realized that I, I couldn't come up with anything except for basically just talking about myself. Same, same kind of thing. Where, yeah. I never was able to bridge the gap of where can I actually create enough value. Um, and then I realized I can do it with a podcast. I don't have to be the person that has the message. I can be the delivery method for lots of people that have lots of messages. And so right. this is kind of, the podcast for me replaced uh, my effort into trying to write a book. I hired a ghostwriter and stuff. I hated the way he wrote. You know, for me, being an egomaniac, it, like that's yeah. not my voice. That's that's not the way I would it's say It's hard. That. Yeah. It's hard to find a writer who, you know, who has your voice. I was really lucky. Joan Hamilton was somebody that I knew. She wrote Meg Whitman's book. Oh, and really? she had interviewed me for Meg Whitman's book at eBay. Yeah, that's how I got to know Joan. Oh, and awesome. Joan was really uh, fascinated with trust and safety and uh, about the things that we were doing. So, you know, my my wife knew Joan and reached out to her. Joan is a, a good ghostwriter, finds your voice. Yeah. And so I think she really did that. And, you know, when the publisher came back to me for the audio book, they said, well, you know, do you want to have a, a say in who reads the audio book? And I said, well, actually, I kind of like the audio book because yeah. it, 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 it's my story in a lot of ways. And they let me audition. And thankfully, they, I, 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 uh, I won the audition and got to read my own audio book. But I think a, a book like this, a good book is personal. And mm-hmm. you, you really do feel attached to the message. And even though Joan was my, my, uh, my writer in a sense, uh, uh, I did a, a lot of the writing myself and a lot of the writing with her just because I wanted it. It had to be authentic to me. Yeah. I was I was actually surprised when you just told me that you had a writer because when I read it, yeah. I mean, you and I didn't work a ton together, but I'm like, that's Rob. I'm like, it, it, it yeah. very much <laughs> right. like yeah. you. Yeah. 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 You intimidated the shit out of me when I first worked at Trust of Safety. <laughs> I came back, I said to my wife, I said, this guy works for the FBI or something. I don't know. We got to be careful. He'll have us killed. If we're... <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it, it, the, the prosecutor thing scares people, but I think a lot of people, when they get to know me, they're like, you know, wow, he's act, he, can, he actually can laugh and has a sense of humor. And I think that's actually a powerful tool. You know, the book, people, people come to me and they say, Rob, I, I actually enjoyed your book. Like they were expecting Plato and Socrates and it would be uh, uh, you know, pulling teeth. Uh, I, I think humor is an important way to make your point. So I think the book's got a lot of stories in it and it's got a lot of humor. Uh, it, it's a way to engage people. Uh, and a way to break down barriers. So uh, it does something that's really interesting. For the where I'm at in the book so far, it has presented several cases of sort of moral and ethical dilemmas, or you know, and uh, what do you call them? Code, uh, code uh, moments. Code moments. The real, yeah, they're basically story, you know, real stories that Joan and I are aware of. Uh, would the facts change slightly in order to uh, protect, you know, the protect, <laughs> protect, protect the innocent like, or the guilty. Yeah. Uh, but they, each chapter has a couple of code moments that illustrate the point in the chapter, but they're real stories. And then at the back of the book, there's a discussion of yeah. the uh, of the ethical uh, implications behind each one of the stories. People love learning from stories. Uh, and and yeah. so that, that actually, uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, one of the bits of feedback I've gotten about the book is that people love that. I think I could go do another book and just fill it just with, on with moments and stories and yeah, it'd be like the, the follow-up. I could get you a could. whole series out of this. Yeah. 
it was, what I liked about it was you didn't just give the answers. It made you think like, okay, all right, especially from my position, I'm like, okay, if I was going through that or if that was going on at my shop, what would I do? And then I went back, you know, I really thought about it before I went back and look at the discussion on it and uh, definitely thought provoking. I mean, well, there are sometimes aren't right answers to these. Sometimes there are different paths. And uh, it was funny. Somebody wrote me a note saying, Rob, I loved your book, but I disagreed with your answer on about half of the code moments. I wrote back and said, terrific. That's great. Yeah, because the yeah. point behind it isn't to tell you the answer. The point behind it is to, to, to get the mind working mm. about, you know, what's right for you, what's right for your business with your mission. And your company's values, and you might come to a different conclusion than I do. There, I don't have any monopoly on integrity or ethics. <laughs> I have a perspective on it. I have a yeah. perspective. Well, that's the tough thing about this entire topic. I mean, you say tell the truth. Well, what's your truth versus my truth based on our past experiences in life? Those can be two very different things. And I think sure. to your point, that's probably why it needs to be defined so clearly because my statement of tell the truth is a guiding principle that every employee can fall back on, but it doesn't necessarily spell it out in enough detail. I mean, reading your book, going, I really do need to define this a little clearly, a, a little more clearly. And um, well, ambiguity and silence are the enemies of integrity. That's mm -hmm. one thing that Dan Ariely at Duke University taught me. But, and why? Well, the, the reason is that I used to think, Nate, that there are people that have integrity and people that don't have integrity. You can divide the world into those two buckets. And in reality, it's a lot cloudier than that mm. uh, because in integrity can be cloudy. And what I found and what Dan Ariely taught me is that we all see the world through our own eyes, through our own life experiences, our own religion, our own upbringing. But we all, when we're, we're confronted with an integrity situation, uh, we are all biased toward what is in our own self-interest. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's almost an answer we root for in those gray ethical challenges. The answer we root for is the one that will benefit us most, naturally. <laughs> yeah. Now, can we go with the one that is good for us? Well, that depends on, can we go that direction and still feel good about ourselves? Because we all want to feel good about ourselves. Can we, can we take the path that is beneficial to us, yet still go to sleep at night feeling like we're a good person? And the people and companies that have a lot of creative people and a lot of really smart people actually are the ones that have the most challenges with integrity. Because the, the more creative you are, the better you are at rationalizing <laughs> particular actions, right? I can see that. And th therefore, that, yeah. that can take you down a bad path. So uh, I, I think the, that's why you need specificity. That's why you need to talk about integrity. Because I think left to our own devices, each of us will tend to naturally want to fudge all toward the answer that will benefit us, even if that probably isn't the right answer. Well, we have cognitive biases. And if you're not self-aware, then that conversation doesn't mean anything. It's like what you say, if you're very creative and you're not aware of your cognitive, your, your biases, how you look at the world and you don't understand how the brain works and how we form opinions. And like this, there's very technical things to this. If you study this, you go, well, I think this way, but every time I say that, that's because of a whole bunch of things that are uniquely my past experiences. And once you're aware to that point, you can sort of look at things uh, or be open to realizing that your perspective is not the only one. Well, that, yeah, that kind of self-awareness, I think, is critical. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and you get that kind of self-awareness by, uh, first of all, having a North Star that's fixed, mm -hmm. that you can measure everything against. Um, and number two, just recognizing that that diverse perspectives are really important in the company. So my mm. answer isn't necessarily the right answer or the only answer. And that other people have different life experiences, different cultural upbringing, that they bring really valuable perspectives to the table. And often when I was looking at uh, integrity-related issues that would come up at Airbnb, we had a group of ethics advisors. Uh, and the reason we had a group of ethics advisors is, you know, I didn't want to be Moses, you know, coming down from the mountain with the stone tablets to tell everybody yeah. what ethics was, right? Because I don't feel qualified to do that. I would learn so much by listening to other people's perspective or take on an ethical situation. And they would raise points that I hadn't thought of simply because I didn't have their life experiences. And mm -hmm. I think we ended up making better decisions because they were informed by diverse perspectives. 
Do you think playing devil's advocate that you can get to the point where there's too many people involved with those too many decisions where, where those conversations can be so they can have no end and no answer because, I mean, I guess the word compromise is what I'm looking at, but you get so many people involved and there's so many different opinions. How do you, how do you value all those different opinions, but yet still say, this is the direction we're going? Well, that's leadership. And it, Look, what, what I found is at the end of the day, everyone had to know who's responsible for making the final decision. They have to respect that. You know, everybody, the, everybody had uh, the, uh, uh, the right to express their perspective and their point of view. Everybody had the right to be heard. And then once you were heard, you had to respect the fact that there's a process and the decision might be made that you might disagree with. Uh, but you don't have the right to make the decision yourself. You don't have the right to work at a place that always agrees with your perspective. But you do work at a place that respects your point of view and wants to hear it. Yeah. And there again, if you've clearly defined that, you're going to attract those type of people. That's right. Yeah. That's that makes it. a lot of sense. Um, well, yeah, that it's actually, it's, I, I, I wrote a quote down from the book, framework for consistent decision making. You know, th- this, th- where where it's clearly defined, you then have laid out that framework for consistency. And I, I think it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, briefly without, because I know it's, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty comprehensive. What's the process? There's six C's as you define it, right? Yeah. If we're going to just briefly touch, how does a company start to implement this, implement writing their code of ethics? All right. Well, the first thing you do, I think you need a, you need to get away from the the old way of doing things. The old way of doing things is you pick up the phone, you you ask your lawyer to send a code of ethics <laughs> over, right? Or worse, I know there are a number of companies that go online. They yes. copy somebody else's code of ethics, right? Then they right. put they fill in the blank at the top under company name, and then they email it out to everybody and say, check a box that you've read this, right? Mm. That sort of thing doesn't do any good because everyone knows that literally you're just checking a box and fulfilling a legal requirement. You want to reach people in the heart. So, you know, what you need to do with the with the code of ethics is you need to sit down as a team and you need to talk about it. You need to talk about what are the most common ethical issues that you face in your business and how do you want people to handle it? Hmm. And then you reflect that in a document and you make sure that leadership is bought in. Because if leadership isn't bought in to responding in that particular way, uh, then if leadership isn't going to follow it, then you're better off not having the rule. Yeah. Uh, the worst thing you do is have a rule that, that leaders don't have to follow themselves. Well, that so was I think the old, it's following a process. That was the old right? thing about mission statements that companies would come out with like, you know, 12 paragraph mission statements that nobody could memorize or, or, or integrate. And it was that scenario. People were like, yeah, 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 it's a mission statement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I think it is getting, getting input from diverse perspectives, making sure that leadership is bought into it. And I'll give you an example, you know, uh, dealing with sexual harassment. We decided, uh, we had a meeting at Airbnb. I walked into an executive team meeting and said, uh, I propose that if you're on the executive team of this company, there are 12 of us that run the company, basically. If you're on the executive team, then you should not engage in any romantic encounter of any kind with any employee or any vendor or supplier. Because the imbalance of power and how that imp- impacts the workplace um, really is, is a too dangerous for the company yeah. could affect your career and the brand. We don't need to go there. And we had a discussion about it. And, you know, somebody said, well, Rob, we're all married or in relationships anyway. And I said, well, that may be true, but based on what I'm reading, that doesn't stop people from getting involved in these sorts of things. And in yeah. fact, it makes it worse. Yeah. So we all went around the room and looked at each other in the eye and said, I'm in. Now, once you do that, you now have an agreement that you, you came to with other leaders, person to person, authentic. That means if anybody breaks it, they're breaking their word with every other member of the leadership team, and they are the ones that have to suffer the consequence. Mm -hmm. But you're a lot less likely to have a problem because you were specific about it. You had a conversation about why it was important, and you all bought into it. And I think that's the sort of thing that that more companies need to do. Get away from this idea of well, do not engage in inappropriate relationships. Well, what does that mean? Define inappropriate. And define inappropriate. And let's have an honest conversation about it. But that's, to me, an important part of the 6C process. And, and one other aspect to it that I'll mention is that you can't just put out a code of ethics and then forget about it. 
Uh, it's the sort of thing that you need to, it needs to be a constant touch point. You know, like, Nate, like in your business, you can't just tell everybody, okay, everybody, we're all going to tell the truth. That's a fundamental premise. Everybody got it and then not mention it again for five years. Yeah. Right. It's got to be something that you, um, you constantly bring up in different ways, in different forms, and, and using different uh, ways to get the point across. But in, people need constant reminders of this, right? Because I think left to their own devices, that silence gives people, I think, permission mm -hmm. to start fudging, which you, which leads to lots of problems. So I think it has to become weaved into everything that you do. And as a leader, you're responsible. Leaders are the thermostat for integrity. And what do I mean by that? You know, a thermometer takes the temperature of a room, but a thermostat sets it. Mm. By what you say and what you do, you are setting the thermostat for integrity. And you're creating the temperature in which everyone in that company works. And you have to own that and recognize that as a leader and realize that if you say nothing about integrity, then you're in effect saying that it's not very important and that sets the thermostat in the wrong direction. Yeah. <clears throat> Silence is complicit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. When we first started, uh, we talked about telling the truth and everything. But I never marketed it because I always felt... Uh, well, when you put something out there like that, you're terrified of one incident where somebody's not truthful because, like you said, like you're going to get that shoved down your throat, period. And yeah. But I always felt like we don't need to talk about it. This isn't a marketing ploy. This is will be self-evident to our customers if we do it. And right. it's it's a methodology, not a marketing plan, not a marketing ploy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah. That makes I think you need to talk about it with your employees because you need to oh, drive it into the culture. Maybe you put a sign up on the wall. Maybe you put it in a mission statement posted on your website. I think the point you make, though, is a good one in that uh, there's a lot of cynicism. And so if you make that a big marketing ploy, people will be like, oh, yeah, sure. Right. They're just doing that to, to reel me in. Right. Uh, and, it, and it's meaningless. And it's that, that counterproductive. Do it. That's right. we'll see it. So it's meaningless and counterproductive unless you really walk the talk. And the most important thing is you, you walk the talk and you operate that way. Have you found when you're helping other businesses put this in place that have you ever run into a situation where uh, the the top, the higher ups wanted to put it in play because it was good for business, but yet they didn't necessarily, they weren't really on board or they didn't, were, didn't really have but a strong people, direction? People like that don't call me. <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the interesting thing now. about what I do is that I, it, it, there is preaching to a choir a yeah. bit. Um, but, but what I, where I enjoy working with people is where leaders, leaders will say to me, I know it's important. I want it to be a part of my company. I'm just not sure the right way to do it. Mm. And, and that I think is you know, where I, where I help people because it, it, I, I can't help you if you don't want to truly operate a business with integrity. I can't give you integrity. Buying, buying my book, you know, uh, you know, spending 20 bucks on my book, it's certainly going to give you integrity. But what it can do is if, if you've got integrity and you want to weave it into your company, I think it can be a roadmap for helping you get there. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing as I'm reading it. You're, 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 uh, you're, I already just uh, I sent I sent the link to your book to my CEO and said you need to read this with me. We got to put some stuff in place, you know. Great. And uh, so it's good. It's a great motivator. Like I said, I haven't read a lot of business books in years, and uh, picking this one is up has been good. I mean, you've got me thinking about a lot of stuff because I know how important this stuff is. Uh, it's a good reminder that this can't be a project on the backlog for another year. You know what I mean? It's right it, now. Time to do it. Never. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So, Thank you for that. I appreciate that. You bet. And with that, I probably, unless, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm curious about one more thing. What's next for you? Because <laughs> I really you know what have I'm, an idea of writing the stories as your next book, because I'd read it. Yeah. You know what? I, I've had so much fun you know, playing with this book, you know, yeah. going out and talking about it and going out to companies. I haven't really, I haven't really thought about it. You know, and I, uh, I, I don't know what's next, to be honest with you. I enjoy talking about it. And at this uh, as long as this message resonates with people the way it has since I, you know, I've, the book's been out for about six months, as long as it keeps resonating with people and people want me to still talk about it, uh, may, you know, I'll probably keep doing that. Uh, because it, uh, I, I think uh, I've spent 35 years practicing law. I think I'm, I enjoy doing something different, changing yeah, it up. I bet. 
I bet. Well, I, I really appreciate the book. I really appreciate your time. It was great seeing you again and catching up. And, you know, Thank thanks you, a lot for doing this. I, I wish you just massive success. I know the book already has been really successful yeah. and I hope it just continues to be. And you drive a revolution in companies that want to do stuff better. That's a pretty We're good doing thing. it. Yeah. We're doing it. Thanks for, thanks for uh, bringing me to your audience, mate. I appreciate it. You take Absol- care. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you, Rob. Mm-hmm.